Hi, and welcome back to the Batty.com channel. Today we're updating the video on this 86 through 89 C68 HVAC controller. It's 2022, new face plates are no longer available, but we found a way to reuse the factory face plate, and we'd like to share that with you today. We're gonna power on the controller. This is a controller with the later model firmware, and the way we know that is right now it's doing a self-test. It is evaluating the extent of the travel of this blend door motor. We're gonna give it a couple of minutes to go through that process. It's gone all the way cold. Now it's headed all the way hot. It's learning that position. And the next thing we'll see is that it starts responding to the set point. And now if we adjust the unit cooler, we'll see the motor move cooler. If we go warmer, we'll see the motor move warmer, just like that. So it's common for people to get a controller back from us, plug it in, and try to adjust the temperature right away. And it looks like it's not working like it should. The reality is it's probably doing this self-calibration that I just showed you. When you plug one of these controllers in for the first time, it's best to wait about two minutes before expecting it to work. Could be that it's just doing a self-test. We're gonna run this unit through some tests before we take it apart. So I called the user. The real issue is that sometimes when he hits a bump, the display either blanks out or displays kind of chase lights. We call them disco lights here in the shop. Sometimes the mode button lights also go crazy. We're gonna run it through some basic tests first. We're gonna make sure the cool and the warm buttons work. And they do. Next, we'll check the fan buttons. We're gonna do fan all the way down. Sure enough, those buttons work. The auto button works. And we'll just test each of these buttons. So that tells us all of the buttons are working the way that they should. The last thing we're gonna check before we take the controller apart is we're just checking to see if it can drive all solenoids. I'm looking for a voltage that is approximately the battery voltage across the two electrical contacts of the solenoid. First solenoid is active, the second one's active. The third one's active. To get it to activate the others, we're going to change the set point. And I heard them activate. We'll just confirm that. Fourth one's active, fifth one's active. Some years of C68 owners will have six solenoids inside. We just want to make sure that by adjusting the various modes and temperatures that we're able to get all six to activate. And in this case, we are. So uh, the controller is able to talk to the programmer module. It is able to drive all, all five or six solenoids. It is also able to drive the blend door motor as we saw before. So, so far it looks like it's working like it should. We haven't seen it act up yet. The owner tells me we're looking for an intermittent problem. So we're gonna keep looking for that problem. Next, we're gonna show you how to take the controller apart. There are two metal clips, one here and one here. We're gonna use a small flat blade screwdriver. And we'll just gently pry that away from plastic housing. Next we'll pull the clip on the left the same way. We'll set those clips safely aside. Then we're going to pull the face plate gently away from the circuit board. We see the circuit board inside. We see the back of the face plate. Next we're going to gently lift the plastic tabs away from the circuit board. Everything looks to be in good condition. I see no corrosion on the wiring harness connector. I see nothing burned on the circuit board. I see that it has its original factory capacitors and I can tell that because the conformal coating on this board has uh, them stuck to the board. The power resistor usually looks burned, but it's it's probably fine. I see no leaking capacitors, but that doesn't mean they're good. All right, this is from an 89, which would be 33 years old. And capacitors of this age tend to dry up and eventually short circuit. So we'll replace those. I'm going to separate 
these two boards and have a look at the faceplate. What we see on the faceplate is that this connector deforms over time. It looks more like a smiley face than a straight line at this point, and that means that the, the pressure of these electrical contacts are getting weaker and weaker and, and further away from the circuit board contacts where they're supposed to touch. Part of the repair will be us straightening that connector out, reshaping it. Okay, let's put everything back together and see if we can reproduce the user's problem. First, we'll give it a good bump test. Okay, so bump testing has resulted in a controller which still appears to be working, but uh, basically the, the buttons aren't necessarily, actually what I'm seeing is that the mode buttons are working, but we have no display. And that's one of the symptoms the user reported. Uh -huh. Another way that we can reproduce that problem sometimes is to use something to probe each of the electrical connections that we see right here in this little plastic cutout from the plastic connector. Let's go ahead and get inside the faceplate. The first thing that we're going to do is remove the three bulbs. We're going to turn each about a sixteenth of a turn counterclockwise and pull it out. Set those aside. This looks to be in pretty good shape. All of the pins are still in place. The, the, these plastic rivets that we see hold the faceplate circuit board to the faceplate plastic. They also have the, the job of holding the switch contacts in place. So if we have any missing, we're definitely going to have to replace those. But it, it looks like these are in good shape. Let's go ahead and get it apart. So I'm using some fairly sharp, these are Hakko side cutters. And we're pushing down firmly to expose more of the rivet and trimming. In, instead of cutting off the rivet heads, if you start pulling out the whole pin, uh, go ahead and stop and let's do it a different way. Another way we can do this is to just use an X-Acto knife, gently lift the plastic rivet head. We're going to make sure we, we are being careful not to scratch traces from the circuit board. Okay. That definitely leaves a little bit more of the rivet exposed. So that took us about 10 minutes. Uh, we carefully trimmed away the heads of these rivets. As you can see, we're still left with posts. The posts sticking up above the circuit board or, or flush with the circuit board are going to be needed later on to reattach the circuit board. So leave as much of the, the original plastic as you can. We're gonna use a small flat screwdriver and we're just going to very gently lift the circuit board. We're gonna go all the way around. We've separated the circuit board from the plastic housing. We'll lift the circuit board away. We see the switch contacts, some of which stayed behind in the plastic housing. Some followed the circuit board. We should have six separate strips, and we're going to put those all in the plastic housing. We're also going to leave the plastic housing sitting this way, just because we don't want the buttons to fall out. There are a couple of typical problems with the faceplate circuit board. Number one is the connector becomes misshapen over time. We will fix that by heating and reshaping it. Number two, when that connector starts to deform, these solder joints become cold. There are 16, uh, there we go. There are 16 solder joints uh, on the faceplate connector. We've discovered that touching one of these causes one of the symptoms that the user is reporting. So it's pretty, uh, pretty reproducible. So I think that's probably gonna be our problem. The third problem we see with these is the solder joints on this tend to turn cold, and because of that, we'll resolder this entire display. The fourth issue that we've seen is sometimes liquid spills happen. This is uh, this is a the cleanest board that I've ever seen, and I don't think it's ever seen a liquid spill. But liquid spills tend to cause corrosion in this area here. If we saw that, we'd want to clean that up with some warm water or alcohol and let it dry before we proceed. Let's get it apart and start work on that faceplate. First thing we're gonna do is we're gonna get these LEDs out of the way so that we can work on those solder joints. We're just gonna gently bend them away from the display. We're gonna take our soldering iron. In this case, I am using a Hakko 
FX888. It's a beautiful 65 watt soldering iron with adjustable temperature. I'm running at about 750 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm going to apply a small amount of fresh solder included with the kit. I'm going to use my vacuum solder removal tool. Okay, and we'll repeat that for all 16 of these connections. We're going to be very careful during this process not to move the, uh, the pad of the traces that are connected to these pins. We're applying heat to the junction where the pin of the connector sticks through the pad of the circuit board. We're heating both at the same time, and then we're vacuuming the nut solder away. I'm using some solder braid to get the last little bit of uh, solder out of each of these connections. What we want is the pin moving freely when we're done, not stuck to the, uh, not still stuck to the pad. When I'm sure that each of those pins is moving freely, we're ready for the next step. Next, we're going to use a heat gun. This is uh, a 250-watt heat gun. Basically, heat the connector enough that we're able to reshape that plastic. And if we look at it, as we heat it, it is certainly pulling itself back into a straight line again, which is exactly what we want. I'm going to heat it enough that the plastic becomes soft. Okay. And then I'm going to use something straight, like the edge of the circuit board, to just push that back into line. And I'm going to hold it there for about five minutes until it cools. You can blow on it to cool it off. Or you can just wait five minutes. When the connector is cooled back off, we can see that we've got a nice straight line plastic connector and we're ready to resolder it to the circuit board. We're also gonna add a little bit of liquid flux. Helps the solder flow into these small connections. All right, and again, to solder these, we're going to Heat the connection between the pad and the pin from the connector and we're going to feed in some fresh solder and then we'll remove the heat and we'll remove the solder and we'll just do that for each of these connections. We want to add enough that we completely fill the hole uh, that's formed by the ring of that pad. We don't want to add so much that we short out two of these pads that are next to each other. That's what it looks like before we clean the uh, liquid flux away. We're gonna clean away that liquid flux with some alcohol and an old toothbrush. In this case, I'm using a nylon bristle brush I got from Harbor Freight for about a buck. Two or three applications of alcohol. and the liquid flux should be gone. That's what it looks like. Next we're going to solder the uh, solder joints where this display attaches to the circuit board. Again, we'll just use a bit of flux. Okay. Just a little bit of flux. We'll use a little bit of fresh solder. We'll heat each of those connections. We'll feed in a bit of fresh solder. And then we'll move to the next connection. We're going to do the same thing with the bottom set of contacts.
clean that up. We'll get the uh, extra alcohol out from under the chip. And we're just gonna set this aside to dry for a bit before we put it all back together. One final thing that we're going to do before we, uh, before we put this back together is straighten up the LEDs. We're gonna use some alcohol and a swab to do a final cleanup on these contacts. They're kind of, uh, they're kind of W shaped, they're kind of Batman shaped. What we're doing is just making sure we don't have any dirt, corrosion, liquid flux on the surface of these contacts before we put everything back together. Now, before we put it all back together, we're gonna test those contacts and make sure they still work. We're just gonna use one of these switch contacts. We'll press it several times and it has the desired effect. Okay. Fan down, fan up, fan auto, off, auto, by level, Economy, heater, and defrost. Also, we have rear defrost. That one was kind of hard to see with my finger in the way. And we have external temperature. And they're all doing what they should. The good news is, when we wiggle the contacts, it looks like it's working the way it should, so let's go ahead and put this back together. At this point, we're going to go ahead and dump out the buttons, check everything to make sure that it doesn't need to be cleaned up. If it does, I would soak this in some hot water for about 10 minutes. Uh, that tends to get rid of uh, most uh, liquid spills. We're going to clean up the face plate before we put it back together. Next, I'm going to clean up the electrical contacts. These are what touch the circuit board and cause switch actions. And again, I'm just gonna take a Q-tip and some alcohol, and I'm just gonna wipe once or twice across each of the uh, carbon dots on the back side of these switch contacts. And again, we'll just let those dry for a few minutes before we put it all back together. The kit now includes a drill bit and some screws for the purposes of reattaching the faceplate to the faceplate circuit board. You can use the, uh, one of these pin vices. Uh, we have them for sale on our website, or you can use a small quarter inch drill or anything that will hold this small drill bit. And we're gonna drill holes where those posts should have been. I put our drill bit included with the kit in a standard Dremel tool. We're going to set it to medium speed and we're going to drill in the outline where we see that the pin was. Uh, if, if this isn't flush on yours, just take an X-Acto knife and trim it flush and then we're going to drill straight down through where the pin was. Again, we're only doing this on the four corners. I'm going to start right here. This is a, definitely a messy process. You might want to do this out in the garage. Screws in the kit are about a quarter of an inch long. There's no reason to drill more than a quarter of an inch hole and that will be more than enough for what we're doing here. We're gonna do the same thing for each of these four holes.
We'll clean this up and then show you what it looks like. We've drilled the center of each of these four plastic bosses. And that will let us uh, install screws to hold the circuit board in place. Clean it out well before you go to the next step. Once those are back in place, we're going to reinstall the switch contacts on the plastic posts. If you are missing plastic posts, don't worry. The kit now includes a small piece of plastic rod. Uh, it is possible to replace missing switch contact posts with the plastic rod that we supply. Cut this flush before we put the switch contacts in place. There's a little air channel that runs through these. It basically lets air escape from a pressed switch contact. I try to put those up on all of the switch contacts so that they're all going the same direction. If we look on these single switch contacts, we have two different types of the single switch contacts, and I'll show you where each one goes. The narrow ones go here on the defrost and external temperature, and the taller ones go here on the cool and the hot buttons. And on these, again, the air channel is at the top, and the, uh, the overhanging rubber, again, is at the top. That makes sure that the switch contact is positioned the way that it should be. We're going to replace the circuit board. We're going to put the LEDs in each hole that's molded into the plastic. We're going to make sure that the switch contacts are in place before we put it back together. And then we're gently going to maneuver each of those pins back through its hole in the circuit board. If they don't snap into place like ours did, just take it back apart and trim off any uh, plastic that's causing the pin not to go through a hole. What we see is that we have uh, a couple of pins missing. We'll fill those in with the plastic rod supplied with the kit. For the rest of them, we're going to use some glue to reattach the faceplate. For these corner screws, we're going to install those with a small Phillips screwdriver and the screw included in the kit. So let's go ahead and put those in place first. We'll get those started. That's what it looks like when we've finished installing the screws. We snug them up, but we don't really put any sort of pressure on them at all. The, the purpose is to hold the circuit board on, and that doesn't take much pressure. Uh, as we can see, the circuit board is flush all the way around. The next step is to replace the missing pins. We're going to use some of the plastic rods supplied with the kit. We're going to trim that flush. I'm using some extra thick super glue so that it doesn't run down onto the switch contacts or any other part of this, uh, the inside of the faceplate. I'm going to put a drop of extra thick super glue onto the flush end of the rod that we just trimmed. We've got a nice little glob on there. We're going to make sure that our switch contacts are lined up. In other words, when I, I look at this from an angle, I can see that the, uh, the, the, the pin that I'm installing, or that the pin that I'm replacing, goes through the rubber contact. The super glue forms a little bead around the circuit board, and that's fine. And we're just going to trim this flush and go to the next one. And again, I'm going to trim the end flush. I'm going to form a little bead of super glue. on the flat end that I just cut. I'm going to check to make sure that the switch contacts are in place. I'm going to push that down. Just in the side a little bit. There you go. Okay. okay. And trim it off. We'll let that dry before we move on to the next step. Optionally, uh, for a better 
uh, attachment of the face plate to the circuit board, we can glue the pins that are sticking up to the top of the circuit board. We can either use the same thick super glue that we used to replace pins, or for a better hold, we can use some five minute epoxy. Uh, since I've already showed you the super glue method, next I'm going to show you the five minute epoxy version. We're just going to put equal parts of resin and hardener onto something, maybe a plastic sheet like this bag that I'm using. We're going to use a stick to stir this thing well. And by well, I mean a minute. We want to mix these things well or this stuff will not set up. By the way, the five minute epoxy that I showed you and the super glue that I showed you all came from my local hobby shop. The tools that we've showed you either came from our website, some of the things that we don't stock, like the uh, side cutters and the small screwdrivers. We picked those up at a local Harbor Freight. So I'm just uh, taking some of the five minute epoxy. We're just gonna dab that on each of these points. We don't need a large amount. We definitely don't wanna try to cram it down the hole. Our, our goal is to kind of, kind of seal up the hole and again, keep that switch contact in place by securing these pins. It has the added bonus of helping to hold the faceplate circuit board onto the faceplate housing. Definitely don't get any of this glue on the contacts where the bulbs are supposed to attach. Those contacts would be on either side of the bulb holes. Keep those nice and clean. All right, we'll get both rows of pins here. I'm going to let that set. Five minute epoxy should be set in about 10 minutes. Here we see the results of our repair job on the faceplate. Everything is glued securely. The faceplate is held on securely by the screws. And again, it's backed up by the uh, by the dots of glue that we put in, on these uh, pin contacts. Let's go ahead and change the bulbs and get the faceplate finished. So to remove the bulb from the socket, okay, that was a tight fit. We just pull the bulb straight out. We make sure the contacts are straight on the new bulb and then push it straight into the socket. I'll do another one of those from a different angle so you can see it. Okay, we'll uh, just pull out the old bulb check the contacts to be sure they're straight. We will do the same thing for the third bulb and socket. Now, to reinstall those in the faceplate, we line up the tabs with the holes in the faceplate. We'll turn it about a sixteenth of a turn clockwise. We'll do that for all three. This one's a bit tricky. I don't have room to put my fingers where they need to be because of the, uh, the white plastic socket. So we're going to use a pair of pliers and just turn that one a sixteenth of a turn as well. Okay, so that's what it looks like when, when we're done. Let's go ahead and put this back together and test it. We're going to plug the circuit board into the faceplate. We'll plug this into our test harness. And as we see, it powers up. Right now it's running the self-calibration as soon as it finishes. We'll go ahead and test all the buttons to make sure they work. Okay. Cold and warm work. Manual down, manual up works, auto works, off, auto, by level, econ, heater, defrost, reader frost, external temperature, they're all working. So that's good news. Let's go to the next step, which is uh, rebuilding the circuit board. So we're gonna take a small flat blade screwdriver, or in my case, a pry bar. We're going to gently lift that capacitor away from the board. I'm heating one end just to let 
the trace release. Okay. Next, I will heat the other end. And remove the old capacitor. I'm going to use my desoldering tool to remove the old solder in the holes. We'll add a little bit of fresh solder. That adds rosin to the, uh, the combination and it kind of helps heat flow. It'll also help the solder flow up out of that small hole. We're going to remove the next capacitor the same way. We're just going to gently lift it away from the board. This one's stuck with conformal coating, so we're going to pry a little bit harder, make sure we don't mash any components underneath when we do it. We'll again heat one end, lift one end out. We will heat the other end. And wait patiently until it releases. Damn it. <clears throat> okay. We're get, adding a little bit of fresh solder, and that adds some rosin to the mixture. Then we vacuum the old solder away. We have one small capacitor and one large capacitor to replace the ones that we removed. On some controllers, you'll see another large capacitor in this area here. If yours has one, it, it's a good idea to go ahead and replace that, and there is a, a replacement included in the kit. Bend the leads at a 90 degree angle, approximately the right space. We will look for the positive marking which is on this end for the large capacitor. Uh, if we look at the capacitor, we'll see negative marking is pointing that way. We'll also see kind of a crimped end. The crimped end is the positive end. So we'll install it in that manner. We'll make sure it's flush to the board. We'll bend the leads apart slightly just to hold it in place while we solder it. Again, to solder this, we're going to heat the junction between the pad on the board and the wire sticking up out of it, the leg of the capacitor. We'll feed in some fresh solder. We'll remove the heat, and we'll move on to the next connection. We'll feed in some fresh solder. We'll wait, and then we'll remove the heat. We'll take that small capacitor. We'll bend the leads at a 90-degree angle approximately the right space apart to fit in the holes on the board. We'll locate the positive marker, which is on the right side here. We will put the crimped end of the capacitor into the hole marked positive. We'll push that in place, and then we'll bend the lead slightly to hold it in place while we solder it. To solder that, same as we did with the other capacitor, we'll heat the junction between the pad on the board and the wire at the same time. We'll feed in some fresh solder. We'll remove the heat and let it cool. We'll go to the next connection. Heat the junction between the pad and the capacitor leg sticking up. Feed in some fresh solder. This one is a ground plane that we're soldering to, so we'll give it a little bit more time. Then we'll remove the heat. If we had a third capacitor in this location, we would go ahead and replace that as well. That's pretty much everything that we need to do on this board. If you have a wire brush, we can clean up this connector. After you do that, spray a little uh, contact cleaner or deoxid on there. We're going to plug the circuit board into the face plate. We'll plug this into our test harness. Just make sure it's working before we put it all back together. The self-calibration process is finished. Let's go ahead and test it. Cooler makes the blend door motor go cooler. That is lever up in this orientation. Warm
warmer. Makes the blend door motor go warmer. Okay. Fan down causes the fan to go down. If we had a fan motor connected, we would uh, hear that the fan motor slowed down. Fan up should cause the opposite, should cause the fan to go faster. Automatic sets, sets it to automatic fan mode. We'll test off, auto, by level, econ, heater, defrost, rear defrost, and external temperature. External temperature of 123 is correct for our harness, but it, uh, it should match your external temperature if you test in the car. Okay, so it looks like it's working. Let's go ahead and get this uh, cleaned up and put back together. We're going to put the circuit board back into the grooves in the housing. And we'll seat everything in place. We're going to place the locking clips on each side. And uh, the way that I'm putting these in on is the flat side forward toward the user. Again, flat side toward the user. While it's running the self-calibration, we're going to clean it up. Get rid of some of the fingerprints we added here in the shop. Thank you so much for watching this July 2022 update video on repairing the 86 through 89 C68 HVAC controller. To get the parts and tools that you've seen us use here in the video, you can go to batty.com. That's B-A-T-E-E dot -E -E com.